Thank you so very much. Pleased to have you here with us tonight. Uh, we certainly do have a treat in store for us, and we're very proud to present to you Michael S. Malone and Laura Seidel. And the two of them tonight will be talking about the insights and stories from Mike's wonderful new book, which is fresh off the presses on July 15, called The Intel Trinity, and uh, basically how Gordon, Robert Noyce, Gordon Moore, and Andy Grove built the world's most important company. You certainly. <laughs> we would like to thank Intel Corporation for making this event possible, especially Tom Waldrop and Denise Bowden, who are just wonderful to work with. Thank you so much. And we would also like to welcome members of the Intel Alumni Network and the Intel Retiree Organization. A word about Churchill Club, a nonprofit independent technology and business forum, about 28 plus years young, 7,500 members strong, with the mission to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. And we do this through the up to 40 programs that we present each year, where like minds, like the people in this room tonight, can connect with new ideas and with one another. We ask our speakers to park their corporate messages at the door and to talk to the people in the room uh, about new insights and uh, information that they can that will hopefully move the needle around the aspects of our mission to inspire people to that. And we're especially excited about what we'll learn tonight about leadership, culture, teams, all of the many aspects that will always be evergreen that Intel has brought us through the years of its evolution. Please do consider joining us on August 13 for the promise of the connected car, what it can be and who can win. And then on August 21, for Mobile Moments, the new battleground for customers. And on September 25th, for the Churchills, an amazing and inspiring program that highlights excellence in innovation, leadership, collaboration, and social good. This is one of the Do Not Miss programs every year. And if you would like to consider joining us or supporting us in some way that is meaningful to you, please know that we would appreciate that very much. So learn more about us at churchillclub.org. And my last announcement, if you're tweeting, please do use the hashtag Churchill Club, and there are other Twitter codes in your event programs. Laura Seidel is the digital culture correspondent for NPR, National Public Radio. And in her work there, she looks at new technologies and how they are transforming our culture and how we live. And over the past decades, Laura has followed closely many of the personalities behind the Silicon Valley technology boom and bust. And I think she's always had a very special interest um, that, and showed us the impact on human beings of the technologies as they were evolving. So for her excellent work, she has been honored by such organizations as American Women in Radio and Television, the National Federation of Community Broadcasters and Women in Communications. Please give Laura Seidel your warmest welcome. Laura. Well, I get the pleasure of introducing Michael S. Malone. <clears throat> um, who um, trumps me in terms of years of coverage of, of this area. Um, let's see, you actually had a brief stint in public relations at Hewlett Packard early on and then left there and went to the San Jose Mercury News in 1980 where he was one of the nation's first, maybe the first, it's hard to confirm those kind of things, high-tech reporters. Uh, and he continued on that beat for basically over 30 years now. And he's written for the New York Times and Forbes. Uh, he's hosted four PBS interview series. He was co-producer and writer of the Emmy-nominated Emmy PBS primetime miniseries, The New Heroes, about social entrepreneurs who are trying to alleviate poverty, illness, and social mores. Um, a very interesting series. And Mike uh, is also the author of, uh, or co-author of 20 books 
Uh, and today we're going to talk about his latest, The Intel Trinity, how Robert Noyce, Gordon Moore, and Andy Grove built the world's most important company. And I really wanted to say that full title because it's, it's quite... Hyperbolic. Yeah. Yes, it's a robust title, and, and I, I want to talk, uh, you know. You're very polite. The, the Intel Trinity, it's, it's kind of biblical, actually, right? Yeah, and I'm sure you meant that. Yeah. Intentionally so. So uh, we're going to get into this further on in the interview, but why did you decide to say these three guys were a trinity? Well, first of all, let me say how intimidated I am to be in a room. You know, when you're talking about semiconductors in front of dot commerce. <laughs> they have no idea what you're talking about, so you can say anything you want. But I can look out here and I can see a thousand years of Intel experience. I got Gene Jones right here and I got Bill David out right there, so anything I say is going to be instantly fact-checked. Uh, I, may, I may just grind down to silence at some point. Uh, why they're I, watching us carefully. I'm yes, sure they are. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and, and out there I also know Andy's listening. And uh, I get notes from him, too, after these events. So uh, I, I'll try not to be careful uh, as best I can. W why did I call it, why did I choose these three yeah, guys? Why, why call why, them a trinity? Yeah, why call them a trinity? Well, the more I looked at it, it was originally going to be called the trilogy. And then I thought, no, 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 that's not sufficiently weighty. Mm. When you look at those three guys, you realize it's sort of noise the father, uh, Grove, Grove, but more than Grove, Moore's Law. I mean, sorry, Noyce the, the Father, Moore, Moore's Law is, is the Holy Spirit of technology. And Andy's kind of the difficult son who, who, who makes good. Uh, that, yeah, no, that's true. And they also became a very, I think, part of it too. They became a powerful leadership tri trio, and we're going to talk more about that. You also, of course, Dub Intel, the world's most important company. Um, clearly, you yeah, like big yeah. titles. Yeah, I knew that would stir things up. Because <laughs> uh, um, you also called, in your book about Hewlett Packard, you called that the greatest company. Yes. Uh, so, so you like big titles. But um, at a time when, right now, I would say when people talk about the world's you know, greatest or biggest companies, they're thinking Apple, they're thinking Google. So why, at this moment, come out with a book that says Intel is the world's most important company? For a couple of reasons. Uh, one of them is covering the latest generation of technologists in San Francisco primarily uh, with social networks and uh, internet-based activities. I was struck that we're so far removed now, so many generations and so far up the food chain that we forget sometimes that everything rests upon semiconductors. Everything rests upon the integrated circuit and processors and that if the folks at Intel tomorrow decided that they just weren't going to do this anymore. I mean, we think, we assume now that Moore, Moore's law is a law, but it's never been a law. It's a social contract. It's basically the semiconductor industry, and especially Intel, because they're the, this is the high priest, or this is the church of Moore's law, uh, made a commitment 50 years ago that we're going to keep maintaining this blistering, insane pace of change. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's resulted in a transformation of the modern world. We live in a world now where we've assimilated incredible continuous change. We're used to it now. But we're the first generations to have actually experienced that. Historically, nobody felt anything like this. And so Intel, because it's always maintained Moore's Law, it looks like it's going to continue maintaining Moore's Law according to the recent reports for another generation. This company is the most important company in the world. Everything in the modern world rests upon this company. And even if it's not in the news every day, even if you've, it's had a few years of difficult times, it's still more important than the latest flash in the pan. You know, uh, I, I, think, I think there's a lot of truth to, to that fact, and I think that Intel is in so many ways about the history of Silicon Valley. So it is a, if, if you look at its history and the people who founded it, you spend the beginning of this book really telling the story of the history of the Valley. Um, its founders, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore, um, are pretty much crucial to the dawn of the computer age as we know it. So, um, I, and I want to talk about these two men actually first about um, how they even made their way here. Uh, and yes. I think it's worth, it's worth remembering how they ended up here and Shockley brought them here. I got to tell you, I love the first generation of Silicon Valley leaders, the, the, the chip guys. I mean, they're, 
they got their fingers dirty. They came from largely working class households. I mean, Andy came under the wire out of Hungary, uh, having survived both the Holocaust and the Iron Curtain. Uh, Gordon's dad was a sheriff over here in Half Moon Bay, rounding up bootleggers. And uh, I have to say, the worst thing is that's probably my phone. Isn't that horrible? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and um, uh, Bob's the son of a preacher, mm -hmm. an itinerant preacher, and apparently not a very good one. I mean, every time he had a church, they kind of took him back to the home office. Uh, so these are real, and, and all these early founders of the Valley, you know, Charlie Spork and Jerry Sanders and all these guys, they were all sons of working men and women. They were, they were down-to-earth people. They lived like normal people. They had an understanding mm -hmm. of what it meant to miss a paycheck or to try to, when you're running a company, meet a payroll that you can't quite meet. I don't see that now. Mm -hmm. I don't see that in San Francisco with the young oligarchs. I mean, they, to them, they're children of privilege and there's a sense of entitlement as opposed to children of the Depression who knew that anything could, it, it could all go away overnight. Yeah, and, it, and I think it made them very resilient. Let's, let's talk about these characters who make up this, this trinity. Let's, let's go back and, and get a little bit, I mean, some people are, probably know the story or probably know some details, but I learned a lot in reading your book. Bob Noyce, he was the son of a preacher. He, he went to Grinnell, he, yep. he was a diver. He was kind of, you know, this very athletic, very bright guy. I think he was the most charismatic figure in Silicon Valley history. Uh, I think that he was forgotten for a long time, his, his premature death. Uh, he missed a lot of the excitement of the 90s. You know, uh, it boomed after him, so he kind of got lost. I think um, Leslie Berlin did a great job of bringing him back, but even then it was almost a little too late. He didn't live long enough to win the Nobel Prize, which he should have shared with Kilby, and Kilby himself said that. Uh, if you look close enough, you can argue that Noyce could have won two or three Nobel Prizes. Uh, but he was gone too soon. He was gone before all the excitement. And so Andy was still around. Andy was on the cover of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. He got his moment in the sun. Gordon is immortal because Moore's Law is going to be studied a thousand years from now mm -hmm. to explain what happened here. But Noyce, his, his appeal was more evanescent. It was, it was personal. You, you, you really experience Bob Noyce by being with Bob Noyce. And having been with most of the great figures of the Valley's history, from Terman and Packard up to the present. Um, Noyce, is, Noyce stands above even Steve Jobs. I mean, Steve Jobs was an extraordinary figure to be around. I mean, you really did feel the reality of distortion mm -hmm. zone. But you didn't like necessarily being in the reality distortion zone. It wasn't fun. <laughs> Bob Noyce was a person, when you talked to him, you kind of wanted to be Bob Noyce. And no one was immune to that. I mean, Steve Jobs wanted Bob Noyce to be his dad. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of impact Bob had, but that's a hard thing to explain to future generations. I think the American Experience documentary uh -huh. of a year ago, I think that was the first time most people really got to see Noyce and appreciate what he was all about. Now, now the thing about Noyce and what he brought to the Valley in so many ways, his story, Gordon Moore's story, the story of Shockley and Fairchild, strikes me as the beginning of the culture of Silicon Valley. So much about that story I see still echoes of today. So these guys came here to work with Shockley, who was going to work on transistors. The most famous applied scientist in the world at that moment. And he was about to win the Nobel, share the Nobel Prize with Bardeen and Bretain for the transistor. So he is the guy that everybody wants to work for. Yeah, and he called, he basically called Robert Noyce called Gordon Moore, and I guess I gather that they picked up the phone and he would say, Shockley here. Yeah, come to California. Come to California, and they, and they came, largely uh, I gather because Shockley's mother lived here, and so yes. that's why Silicon Valley is here. It's because some, he was working degree. at Bell Labs and basically everybody hated him, and he didn't think he was fully appreciated, so he came west, came home, came home to where he grew up. I, yeah, and, and so here he was, they come here, he turns out to be a horrible person to work for. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Shockley's legacy should have been, you know, at, at one point they called him the greatest applied scientist since Boyle or Faraday or something. And now we think of him as the worst boss in the history of the world, you know? 
And thank goodness, in some ways, it turned yeah, out that way. Yeah, right? and remember, he got this reputation during the Mad Men era, where you know, <laughs> management was not particularly enlightened. So if you have a reputation for being a bad, bad manager in that era, you're pretty bad. Uh, but, but I must, I mean, think about these, these eight guys who get invited to come out to California. They're, the, they're the, the best and the brightest of the younger generation of physicists and chemists and computer scientists and electrical engineers. They get here, Shockley says, we're going to commercialize the transistor in a way that nobody else has. And since I'm the guy that invented it, I know how to do it. And within a few months after they get out here, and you, this is how committed, this is how convinced these guys were they wanted to work for him. Bob Noyce bought his house before his job interview. He landed, went out and bought a house, uh, Los Altos, wasn't it? And then went to the interview with Shockley. That was how he was all the way in. He had pushed all of the, the chips to the center Confident, of the table. too. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> always. Um, Shockley wins the Nobel Prize. I mean, they go out to breakfast and celebrate with their boss. Not many of us have ever had bosses that like win the Nobel Prize, uh, you know, a couple weeks after we go to work for them. So they're figuring, we are at the absolute epicenter of the technology revolution. And they're thrilled. And then Shockley starts making them take lie detector tests and challenge them on everything they say and accusing them and just exhibiting absolutely a Captain Bly kind of, <laughs> called the Captain Bly theory of management, which is you just don't trust anybody ever. And uh, after a certain point, they had it. They just couldn't take it anymore. I mean, they were young, they were in their 20s. Um, they just didn't feel like they could stand this guy anymore. And so they kind of secretly met and interestingly, Noyce was the one guy who really wasn't in, the, in this cabal, that it was the other seven guys, uh, to the point that the morning that they quit Shockley, they pulled up in front of, of Bob's house, and they weren't sure if he'd come out or not. And when he came out and got in the car, they knew they could do it. Uh, extraordinary moment, because it not only creates the modern Silicon Valley, it creates the modern model of a startup, of entrepreneurship, uh, thanks to, um, uh, Eugene Kleiner, a lovely gentleman, one of, the, mm -hmm. one of the loveliest men that ever lived in this valley. Kleiner went out and found the money. He met I thought Mark. it was Arthur Rock. Who found Art Rock was a banker. Kleiner found Art. Ah. They worked together. And they're the ones that, and, and you, I was actually in Art Rock's office a few years ago, and mm -hmm. we were talking about it, and he goes, wait a minute. And he went over to a filing cabinet. It was a whole wall of fun cabinets. He went down to the lower left one and he pulled it out and there was a little manila. The piece of paper. Yeah, and it, I've it said, seen it. It said Fairchild. <laughs> yeah, and he pulls it out and it's the yep. list of all the companies that Rock and Kleiner talked to. And it's like General Shu, uh, Kellogg's. I mean, they, they had no idea who would give money to a transistor company. And they ended up with Fairchild, Cameron Instrument. Uh, Sherman Fairchild was a pretty progressive guy in terms of technology, not necessarily in business, which was going to be the problem in the years to come. Right, and so they went out and they started, you know, this company, and they and it is there that Bob Noyce um, came up with the integrated circuit, which is, of course, while, while he was still at Fairchild. Yeah, yeah. In fact, Fairchild did so many things. It, if, if you want to know where they were, they were basically at San Antonio Road and uh, California Street, right in there. It's a it was a stereo shop for a long time. For many years, whenever they painted the walls, you could see where they nailed the tabletops the desktops, and that became the standard height for work tables, for engineers. So they set almost every precedent. You know, they really created what we think of as the valley. They stole power. Use it. You know, they run an extension cord to uh, to a neighbor. Uh, they did all sorts of things. And the amazing thing was, in the thick of all this, as crude as it was, uh, Noyce had an idea of taking the transistor and making it into a reproducible. Uh, design where you could create a whole bunch of them at one time and then wire them together. And uh, I had, it was interesting, I had lunch the other, not to drop a name, but I had lunch the other day with Federico Fajin ah. of the microprocessor fame. And he said, you know, as important as, as, important as Noyce's I, initial idea was and, and uh, uh, Kilby, and as important as the microprocessor was, the breakthrough was Jean Herny. Jean Herny worked, right. essentially Noyce created two teams. Moore eight was the A team, I think, and then and Herney was the B team. Herney comes up with the planar process. 
which basically takes the model explain, of print, yes, printing. Explain, Printing, yeah, it's basically photo, you know, resist, burn it off with acid, put metal down, you got an integrated circuit. The planar process gives us the modern world. And so this little tiny company working out of a concrete tilt-up changes the world which forever. Is, which is amazing, but they can't stay there. And this is the other thing that, that strikes me about noise and more and what they did. I mean, people began to leave and break off in part because there was a clash that I think still exists between East Coast business practices and business practices here. Well, you grew up in, are you from New Jersey? I am. Yeah, yeah. Well, this was Noyce's problem. He had all this talent uh, working for him, arguably the greatest aggregation of talent in business history. Early Fairchild, uh, the individuals there, when it's blew up, produced about a trillion dollars of wealth. Okay, there's been nothing like it. It was crazy. Anybody here from Fairchild days, the early days? You know, I remember Marshall Cox, yes, Gene. I remember Marshall Cox telling me that his very first Fairchild meeting was a sales meeting. He came up from LA and he got there and he had no idea what an integrated circuit was. The two guys who had hired him had basically been drunk and he just sort of took the job. He gets up here and they have a projector and they project the image of an early uh, Fairchild integrated circuit on the screen and he doesn't know how big it is. He actually thinks the projection is life size. And so he's wondering, <laughs> I'm gonna need a bigger car because this thing's eight feet long. Uh, and, and no one disabused him of that notion. And then for, for break they went and they just had a couple sawhorses with some plywood sheets on it and they had bottles of whiskey and brownies and that was break. And, and, th and so it was just like a gigantic frat house. And they go to the wagon wheel after work and everybody would get plowed and they'd crash their cars on the way home. And this and is also the beginning of Silicon Valley, this here, is right? I mean, this is, you know, th this is a tradition that's continued. Well, well, and see, that's one of the reasons, another reasons for calling it the Trinity, because there's this sort of biblical beginning of the valley. You have, you have Hewlett and Packard up on the hill in Stanford Industrial Park, and it's sort of Apollonian. You know, I remember working there, <laughs> you know, and I, I worked, I worked right on the hill at HP, and right out of college, and I remember the horses on the hill, and, the, and you know, it, everything was beautiful, and there were berms of grass, and there were no sidewalks, and it was just like, this was the ideal of what the digital age was supposed to look like. And the reality was shockly, it was Dionysian, it was down on the valley floor, <laughs> traffic, you know, the wagon wheel, uh, just, Crazy. I heard some divorces happened as a result of some of what. Went oh, many, on there. many. Yeah. Yeah, many, many. Some rearranging and, and yes, marriages. Uh, marrying secretaries. Uh, it was wild. Uh, it was just crazy. And these guys who went on sales calls. Uh, this was another example. I think it was Marshall Cox again, or Barry Meriden told me this story. They went out on a sales call, and as they were going in the building, one of the other guys turns to him and says, uh, "You're VP of marketing." And they just made up job titles when they went in to sell stuff. I mean, this was early Fairchild. Uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was wonderful in its own way. I mean, you had absolutely crazy characters. Uh, who's the great linear designer? Bob Weiler, yeah. He, he it's literally- good when you get the answers from the audience. Yeah, when, he got, he, when he got frustrated, designing something, he would go out and chop a tree down in front of Fairchild. <laughs> I had a report once of a guy walking through, the, walking through the old Fairchild building back when it got to Ellis Street wearing uh, twin bandoleros of bullets and a sombrero. Okay, this is Fairchild. So, so I, I want to sort of move us to the founding of Intel. And, and part of what happened, I think, was that um, as it started to do well, and back east they saw it's doing well, they started to sort of put hierarchy and they, you know, passed over Bob Noyce, I think, for a promotion. And th they were frustrated. I think their ideas about how to run a business and uh, Bob had, had worked at Philco for a while and seen companies where the money didn't go into innovation, it went into all this garbage. And so he and Gordon decide to leave Fairchild, as, and many, many did. And, yeah. and start their own company. And essentially, and here's where the very important relationship with Andy Grove happens. I mean, Gordon had hired Andy, right, right, to come work there, and Andy loved Gordon, and Gordon said, I'm leaving, and Andy basically said, well, if you're going, I'm leaving with you. Right. And, and they, they go off and- And then Gordon says, Bob's coming too. And Andy said, oh, I don't know if I wanna do it. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
The problem with Fairchild was, keep in mind, you have Hewlett Packard, Palo Alto, arguably the most enlightened company, during the Bill and Dave era, the most enlightened company that ever existed. They're handing out profit sharing checks. They're giving out stock options. They're giving Christmas bonuses at the, at the Christmas party. They're doing all of these things. At Fairchild, and I remember experiencing this mm. deeply when I was at the San Jose Mercury News. The Mercury News was three times the size of any other paper in the country during, mm -hmm. during the boom of the 80s. And we used to joke that a Brinks truck would back up to Night, on Night Reader Way, and they just take all the profits and put it in the back and drive it to Miami. And it would propped up all the papers in the country. This is what Fairchild was going through, Fairchild Semiconductor. They were the hottest company on the planet. And yet, they were being treated as a cash cow by Fairchild back east. Noyce should have been taken up on to the executive level. He probably would have turned it down, but at least he should have been offered it. They didn't offer it to him. Their attitude was, it's a bunch of gearheads out in California, and they're making a lot of money. Let's take the money and do stuff with it. Let's prop up all our other, other operations. And so uh, the first guy to go was Bob Weidler, the wild man, the guy who, who actually, when he went, he went to National Semiconductor, and when they were so broke they couldn't afford the gardener to mow the lawns, he went out and bought a goat and, and, and tied it. <laughs> tied it to the front of the building and had it eat the grass, and then he threw the goat in the back of a Mercedes convertible and drove to a bar and auctioned it off from the bar. California is yeah. so weird, isn't oh, it? I mean, uh, I love this man. I mean, it's great. There, there are stories about, there are stories of Weidler at a national semiconductor conference, I'm not sure which one it was, it was back in New York, and he got in a fight in the back of the hall right before he was supposed to give a speech, and he came up on stage with his shirt torn off, covered with blood. To give a speech. He ended up in Mexico, uh, lived in Mexico for the rest of his life. I, 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 always, I, I, I always like to give credit to him because I think he's the most interesting guy this town has ever produced. And whenever we talk about these crazy young, you know, uh -huh. dot com types, I, you're like, no, you, you, you didn't you, meet Bob Weiler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't know the real crazy. So anyway, Fairchild, Weiler was the first one to go. He had to fill out an exit mm -hmm. document of why he was leaving. Mm -hmm. It was five pages long. He just, on each page, he wrote, I want to be rich and turn that in and left and he did he got rich and then all of a sudden everybody started going wait a minute if he can go and make a lot of money why are we still here where we don't get rewarded for the success of what we've done there's no meritocracy here mm. nobody felt it more than noise because he wanted to reward everybody he's back there yeah. back east begging it and they t keep turning him down so then the company starts to bleed and it bleeds fast they're going out of every door uh, they were recruiting at the wagon wheel. I mean, guys would, would quit jobs that night. You know, they'd work all day, then switch to another place that night. And finally, and Noyce said, more kept coming in saying, should we go? And Noyce said, no, no, not yet, not yet. And finally, he had just been insulted one too many times. I think it was when they invited him back to New Jersey, and there was a blizzard, and no one told him that the company was closed, and he marched a mile through the snow to get to Fairchild headquarters to find out it was locked. And I think at that moment he said, okay, these guys are never gonna respect me. So he and, he and Moore leave. And Moore brings, brings Andy. And they, and they are able, at this point, they're well known and we've got the beginnings of venture capital, his, you know, and he, they go to Arthur Rock and yeah. he raises money for him. In fact, I, I interviewed Gordon and Andy together a couple of years ago and Gordon told me that he actually, they had to turn away people who were calling his home saying they wanted to give money to this company they were Yeah, starting. he raised, I think they raised all the money they needed in 48 hours. And Art Rock said we could have done it in 48 minutes in the internet age. We had to wait for like mail and telegrams to come in. But yeah. So they go, they need a product. Right. And they got to get one out the door. I gather that it was, it was very difficult in those early days for Intel. Um, yeah, you got to understand the different world it was. I mean, Right now, when you go to a, a semiconductor fab, it's $10 billion, and everybody's in clean room suits, and they're, and they're scrubbing the air, and the water is actually cleaner than the stuff they use to clean human organs during surgery. I mean, it costs as much as the Manhattan Project. Back then, these were in open rooms with, in the hot days, they'd open the window, and if, and if the, guy, the farmer next door was putting down fertilizer, their yield rate would fall. And if, guys, if men didn't come back from the men's room and didn't wash their hands, yield rates would fall. And, and, and the groundwater would come up and yield rates would fall. And Intel announces, it just knocks the entire electronics world on its ear by announcing a breakthrough product in every major field in mm -hmm. semiconductors, basically all at once. Memory, logic, um, MOS, bipolar, and they just do it all, all at once. 
And everyone's going, this is the greatest company on earth. I mean, these guys just went around for six mm -hmm. months, and we have these two legends. We figured they'd do something great. And they were very coy. They said, well, we may just do some research, you know, at the beginning. They announced them, but then they got to build them. And they couldn't build them. And so Intel almost died in his first couple years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the credit really, the guy who in many ways saved Intel at the beginning is Les Vidas, the other mad Hungarian. Actual employee number three. Andy mm -hmm. has never gotten over that, but apparently Les filed his papers before Andy did. So Les was employee number three. There was some other tensions too, uh -huh. as I already noted. Andy almost didn't go right. to Intel because he really, the relationship between Andy Grove and Bob Noyce is a very, very complicated one. And I still don't entirely understand it. I gave Andy the last line in the book Yes. And it almost undermines everything I said for the previous 500 pages about that relationship. Well, he wells up in tears when re remembering Noyce and suddenly says he was yeah. m like my favorite. I, I miss him the most. I miss him the most. Yeah. yeah. And But you read over 40 years, you know, just continuous tension. And Andy saying he thought that, that Noyce was a terrible boss. Not an not a evil boss like Shockley, but such a laissez-faire, right. wanting to be loved boss at uh, Fairchild, that that's why the company had eventually gotten into trouble with their technology, not just in relation to the parent company. He had real doubts about whether Intel could survive with Bob Noyce at the top. But Bob did, I mean, he pulled it out. I mean, he had a sort of skunk works project. The I thing think, that right? you have to appreciate about Bob Noyce is he is the biggest risk taker ever. Mm -hmm. He bets Intel several times. And in doing so, he's also the luckiest guy. Uh, he never seems to break a sweat on this stuff. He takes these gigantic risks with his company. I mean, the, the more you know about this guy, the more amazing he becomes. Uh, he's a riverboat gambler, and he's willing to even commit subterfuge against his own company. The invention of the microprocessor was a secret project that Noyce never told anybody about. He eventually told Gordon, but he never told Andy. You know, Andy found out, and exploded, understandably, because the company was in serious trouble. And here's Noyce diverting money and talent, you know, Hoff and, and, and uh, Mazur and Fagin, moving them over on this secret project that when the company really needed those guys to keep the company's doors open, Noyce bet the store and he won. He always won. Which is, which is amazing. And yeah. yet... Yeah, and he almost killed Steve Jobs. I mean, he takes up flying. <laughs> yeah. Well, well... Bill here will tell you what it's like to helicopter ski with Noyce. I had Jim Morgan say to me, yeah, Bill and I, we go down the hill like this, and Noyce would just go straight down, and we thought, he's going to die every time. Uh, and he was flying with uh, Steve Jobs, and they came very close to crashing. And, and Jobs was thinking that his epitaph would be, you know, uh, Apple and Intel founder die in fiery crash, and Noyce somehow pulled the plane out at the last moment and landed it. He, it sounds like he was a very lucky guy. You know, there's, there's a story, there's so many interesting stories that happen in this company. One of the ones that I found interesting, though, is that here you had these brilliant scientists, and one of the reasons that, that Intel ended up in all our PCs really had more to do with marketing than the better technology, and I, I found this in, in the book right. to be a very interesting story, and this is, I guess, in with 79, right? Motorola comes out with a chip. Yeah. Uh, is Regis here by chance? Okay, so we have one of the members of Operation Crush here. Uh, he'll deny it, but I, I absolutely am convinced that all modern marketing comes from Operation Crush because that's the moment you move away from. Basically, Intel screwed up. I, I, I gave a speech at Intel, some of you heard it, I'm sure, on the web, where I basically said, this is a company I'm convinced made more mistakes than any company in the world. Mm -hmm. But what makes, uh, and I say that in a positive way because Companies that make very few mistakes only come in two forms. Startups that make one mistake and they're gone. And old line companies that try to be risk averse and not make mistakes and just become superfluous and fade away. Intel's still vital because it keeps taking big risks. I mean, it just paid for five years for a, a, a risk that uh, Craig Barra took that frankly was a smart move, but turned out to be he zigged when he should have zagged. Uh, Intel makes big mistakes, but it's genius is not its technology or its lack of failures. Intel's genius is its ability to recover from mistakes. You can't 
succeed big if you don't risk big. But you've got to be able to recover if you screw up. Otherwise, you'll just, you'll die. Well, Operation Crush, I mean, just... Intel fell behind. It was so cocky that it had the greatest micro... We, we invented the microprocessor. We lead the industry. We're the technological innovators. Motorola caught up. Motorola passed Intel. And uh, it just sent shockwaves through the company. And that's when Andy, in, in a brilliant moment of leadership, pulled together the marketing team, including Bill here and, and uh, Regis McKenna and a number of others, put them in a room for a weekend and said, come out with an answer. And what they came out with was the notion, and uh, they got it from some, uh, who was the marketing? Ted Levitt. They got the idea from him, the idea that you're not selling a product, you're selling a solution. And so when they put together their inferior device with all the stuff they were doing, emulators and design tools and service and support, mm -hmm. they had a better product, they argued, for users than Motorola did. And Motorola, Motorola should have reacted by saying, well, we've got that too. But instead, they, they just, had ne it was like they had seen, it was like a, like a dinosaur seeing a mammal for the first time. They had no idea what they were looking at, and they froze. And, and Motorola froze for six months, not putting out a new catalog or anything else. Intel ran past them. And then in the critical moment, because one of the things they did was set really high quotas for the salespeople, mm -hmm. they had a salesman actually do the, do the thing that nobody ever dared to do. He walked into IBM in Boca Raton, and IBM just happened to be designing the PC and said, come on in, to his disbelief. And as a result, Intel won the, won the semiconductor wars. Which is, I mean, it is an incredible story uh, and, and says a lot about how marketing sometimes wins over technology. But yeah, I used to always, when I was running Forbes ASAP magazine, I had these endless arguments with George Gilder. And he would always say, technology always wins in the end. And I said, no, no, marketing always wins in the end. Because mm. the, the valley is littered with the skeletons of companies that had great products, but not great solutions. I want to talk about, I mean, you had Noyce run the company, and he sort of recedes uh, more as time goes by and um, came to an early death. Gordon Moore runs the company, and then Andy gets to the helm, I guess, in the, in the 80s. Yeah. He, uh, he, and I actually had the opportunity, as we were talking earlier, to interview uh, Gordon and Andy together, and they recalled the moment when basically they had to make the choice to get out of the memory business. Yeah, this it almost is an amazing feat It almost sounds Andy's apocryphal, that story, but I, I've, heard, I've heard it too from both of them. It, it seems to be true. And I'm sure all you Intelers know the story, but everybody else, Intel, if you had asked anybody what Intel did, in uh, you know 1975, they would have said we're a memory company. We're the biggest, you know, we're the hottest memory company on earth. Intel was synonymous with memory, and even after the introduction of the microprocessor, it was still a memory company. And uh, what was happening though was memory chips were becoming commoditized. The Japanese were coming on strong, and uh, it was just impossible to make a lot of money anymore in the memory mm -hmm. business. Meanwhile, this microprocessor thing, which the company had sort of done on the side, didn't quite know what to do with it. Uh, I mean, it took, I think, it, there, was, there was a report, I think Ed, Ed Gelback and Reese McKenna, I think, wrote a report saying, here are potential applications for the microprocessor. You know, automatic toilet flushing, you know, and all these things, drug sniffing. None of them came true, okay? But it was just enough to convince the, the, the higher-ups of the company, well, let's stick with this thing, even though it's expensive and no one seems to want to design it in. Well, microprocessors finally took off, and now the company has a dilemma. The founders see themselves as a memory company, and microprocessors is Johnny-come-lately technology. All the employees of Intel think of themselves as a microprocessor company, and they know that's where the company needs to go. And this is one of those moments that will destroy a company, where management is blind to reality. And apparently, as the story goes, Gordon and Andy sat in an office together and one of them looked at the other and said, if it was two other guys instead of us, what would we do? And the other one said, we'd get out of memory. And, they, and so the, I think it was Andy said, let's, go up, let's get up, go outside, come back in as those two guys. And that's when they came back and, and Intel got out of the memory business. Yeah, and, and I mean, they, they told me that's the exact story they told and bet, me. So. And bet this, once again, betting the store, this time on microprocessors, mm -hmm. which was maybe the best bet any company's made in the last 50 years. Yeah, and they save, save, the, uh, save the company. You know, <clears throat> it's, 
I mean, this is a company that survived, although it's now at a challenging moment as things move to mobile. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know... Intel went to networks, the world went to mobile. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I, there was a, a quote that Andy, uh, Andy Grove said, um, actually, when I interviewed him, which I, I kind of liked. He said, to stand um, at six feet deep, at a deep hole, to come out, it requires a very deep determination. This is Intelism. When you find yourself in a six foot deep hole, stop digging and don't make it worse. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and it seems like right now, you know, Intel's in kind of a more challenging moment for the company. Yeah, and I think for several reasons. One of them is, you know, zigging when they should have zagged. The other thing is the zeitgeist has moved on. You know, all the excitements in San Francisco, you know, with that world. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to market Intel inside or any kind of, you know, breakthrough marketing scheme in a world of, you know, uh, Teslas. And, and uh, Ubers and all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge facing the company. There's also just a matter of succession. I mean, Hewlett Packard didn't really survive the, the loss of uh, Hewlett and Packard. I mean, you, you had some good people right after, but you know, it, it's been a lost company for a long time. It's, I think you not only have to follow two historic figures when you take over Intel, but you also have to follow Andy. And Andy arguably is the greatest CEO of the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, a force of nature, and so creating a, to to manage the culture that he created has got to be a huge challenge. On the positive side, the numbers have started to turn up recently. The last couple of weeks, when I was writing this book, it was sort of kind of the you know as I'm finishing the book, it's not a happy ending. Lately, it's looking pretty good. Uh, the second thing is, this is the company that, as I said, this is the high church of Moore's law. As long as Intel adheres to its historic quest, its destiny, to keep moving Moore's Law forward. And some of these recent announcements, 3D you know, transistors and some of the stuff coming out of IBM, it can keep going. And as long as Intel keeps moving the ball down the field, that endless field of endless doubling. By the way, I, I wrote a piece um, for Fortune, I think it was, recently. And I said, Gordon did us a real disservice with Moore's Law. Because if you remember, when he originally did it, he, he only had like five memory chips yeah. to work from. And he kind of, you know, 16K was maybe the most dense. He drew it and he put it on graph paper and it went like that right off the top of the page. And he went, oh, that's not going to work because he had to put it in Electronics Magazine. So he wired that up and he got regular and log paper. And he got a nice flat line. And that's Moore's Law, the 30%. Uh -huh. And that's what we've all been living with for the last 50 years. And we've, 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 we've grown accustomed to that nice flat line. And it has diluted us to what's really going on, the amount of change taking place. So working with, uh, working with Intel, uh -huh. working with Tom Waldrop, we, repro we redid the original uh, chart, but on regular graph paper. And it goes like this, 1960 to 2005, pretty shallow. 2005, it starts turning straight huh. up. Which, and, and then you think about it, you go, wait a minute, integrated circuits, mini computers, personal computers, smartphone, the internet, social networking, big data, all of it's sitting in the foothills. And we just began assaulting the Himalayas. Huh. And it's going to get crazy from here on out. Are you, is, is this has to do with the rate of change? Rate of change, the improvements in performance. Hmm. It's, it's literally... The modern microprocessor is literally unimaginable. We used to use fun analogies, you know, grains right. of rice on the chessboard, and uh, oh, that, that that if you took all the, the, the lines on a on a on a mask for an integrated circuit, it would look like the uh, all the streets and roads and power lines and buildings in a in a midwestern city. But now the numbers are just gigantic. I mean, it's the modern the a modern microprocessor chip from Intel has more complexity than like the city of Shanghai. <laughs> yeah, and, and Gordon figured out a few years ago the number of transistors being fabricated each year is greater than the number of raindrops that fall over the course of, over the course of a year in California, and now he's revised that to like the Western Hemisphere. I mean, these are numbers we can't even imagine. Right. The human heart beats, in the course of a lifetime, almost every animal, one billion beats. Right. And we used to say, well, you know, a modern chip goes through an entire lifetime in a second. But now it's going through 10 lifetimes in a second. Uh, this, these are numbers that are beyond human kin. And that's kind of 
both it's, scary it, and exciting. It, it is, well, and we have, you know, something I want to get to before we take some questions is, um, I did have the opportunity to ask Andy and Gordon a bit about the current generation and the current crop, and they <laughs> didn't have the nicest things to say. Yeah, um, yeah. I, you know, um, I mean, you know, among, among the things When you they, have to argue that you're not an oligarch, that's always a bad sign. It is definitely yeah. a bad sign. I mean, you know, um, basically, they weren't sure if they would start a company here now, if they were starting a company. Yeah. They, um, uh, Andy complained about the worth work ethic here. Yeah. Um, there weren't enough hardcore scientists anymore. I'll buy that one. I'm not sure about the work ethic. But, but the other thing Andy said, he said, he said uh, exit strategy. I hate these two words. He said, we didn't have an exit strategy. I mean, you know, you just keep working, and, it, and you sink or swim, and, and I, he I had really... Jerry, Jerry Sanders said to me once, AMD went public. He said, we went public in 19, whatever it was. He says, that was back when you had to have a profit to go public. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, and, and, and so I, I, I kind of wonder, you know, your take on, because you've covered, you know, that generation and this generation. Yeah, and I spent a lot of time with the new guys. Yeah, are they being, are they being you know, old curmudgeons? Oh, you didn't know what it was like in our day, and... No. Yeah, that, that one's complicated. Um, I, I much preferred the older generation. These guys were older than, you know, they were a generation ahead of me because they were real down to earth. Remember, semiconductors is a chemical business. I mean, it's not, a, it's not code. I mean, code's there now, but it's really, you get your hands dirty. And these were the, the sons and daughters of working class people. Uh, I look at um, the modern Web 2.0 slash social networking world in San Francisco. And these are sons and daughters of professional people and quite well educated. Uh, and they're, they're creating non-physical things. And there's a distinct difference. I, I really think there's a distinct worldview difference between hardware and software, between boxes and code. And I think code people tend to be philosophical in weird ways, you know, like do no evil. I remember, I, remember, I remember I was with Eric Schmidt, and they were getting ready, they were getting the Google Prospectus together, and I said, well, what's this thing on the back? What's this manifesto? This do no evil stuff, and, uh, and, and Eric said, um, the kids really want to do that. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice and, thought. And I think that's a turning point. You know, you got, you got Eric Schmidt, you know, he's Novell, he's Sun, you know, they're mm -hmm. building boxes, and he goes, to, he goes to Google, and they got the dogs, and they're sleeping on the floor, and, you know, it's a different reality. And I think uh, it, it, the, the code people think in, in huge, sweeping ways, and that's, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. when, they th when they talk about a product, they talk about reaching, you know, viralizing it out to a billion people. That's the impressive side. The unimpressive side is they don't really understand any of those individual people. You know, I think, I think the, the story of Facebook is one of continuous violation of people's privacy to monetize that information for money. Now, they may get lucky because I talk mm -hmm. to my kids and they say, oh, come on, Dad, there is no privacy anymore. They've sort of accepted that. I don't know if that's entirely true. Uh, the old guard, you know, they were just trying to get product out the door. They weren't trying to change the world. They looked up and realized they had changed the world. In fact, if you look at that Annus Mirabilis of 1969, you have a man on the moon, you have Woodstock, you have mm -hmm. uh, the integrated, well, you have the microprocessor. Mm -hmm. And if you were to look at all those, then you wouldn't have never noticed the microprocessor. You would have said, well, the future is either gonna be the Woodstock generation or we're gonna walk on the moon. We're all gonna have atomic helicopters. We're working on that right well, now. Yeah, you know, yeah exactly. Uh, these guys with their hands on, they changed the world without really knowing they were doing it. I like hardware. And I, I, uh, I was just uh, thinking the other day, I was driving through downtown Sunnyvale and there was these giant buildings. And I realized LinkedIn is now in Sunnyvale. And Google's moving south towards you know, Moffett Field. Apple's building the donut in Cupertino. Tesla's in Palo Alto. That we're be, I think we're going through another fundamental shift of Silicon Valley. Remember, that the, the, the capital of Silicon Valley was Palo Alto, Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Santa Clara, San Jose, and then jumped. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to head down to Gilroy or head east to Hayward or something. It jumped to San Francisco with the dot-com era. It's been there ever since. But as I look around, I'm seeing a fundamental shift back towards hardware. 
and you don't build hardware in San Francisco. Hardware is built by people with husbands and wives and babies and mortgages. San Francisco doesn't have any of those things, you know? No, I mean, and you know it better than I do because you look at all these, you look at all these 23 year old turn 35 year old Twitter employees, you know, Evan Biz both have kids now, you know, they're, they're changing diapers. Uh, and you look around, you go, do I really want to raise my kid in this city? No. No. Didn't so you move, you move out. And so I think the Valley's moving east. It's heading out into Livermore and beyond into San, jo San Joaquin County. That's going to be divisions and manufacturing and, and labs. I think the hardware design is going to be right here. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, we're literally kind of ground zero of where I think Silicon Valley is for the next 10 years. Seems like a great moment to pause and take some questions. If we, I, there's already a quick, hand quick, up. quick, quick question. How All many, right. how many people here worked at Intel? So you guys are all Intel alums, most right. of you. How many of you worked at Intel for ten years? Twenty. Thirty. Well, yeah, you're, I'm gonna. You're, you're the you're the outlier. No. Thirty. Thirty years. Okay. There we go. I had uh, 40. I think we're down to Gene, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How many people have lived in Silicon Valley for 30 years? Okay, 40. Mm. 50. Okay, I mean, this, this is wonderful. This is, so you guys are like neighbors. This is, this is a hometown crowd. So when you ask your question, that, that's just a prelude to be nice on your questions. <laughs> No, no, I, I think... I'm I, sure we've said something wrong yeah, up here, and you're no, going to let us know about it. But. I do think that there is a Silicon Valley sensibility, and I think it's very distinct from everywhere else in the world. I think that's why there's only one Silicon Valley. And I, I, I've given serious thought I'm, to writing a piece for the Wall Street Journal saying the next Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley, that we're just going to morph again. And those of you who have been here 30, 40 years, you know that it's not a continuous story. It's a constant morphing and uh, regeneration into something new. And I think that new is, is a physical product empowered by the web. I think, I think we're heading into the hardware era again. Okay, any All questions? Right. Okay. Questions, criticisms? Okay, what, <laughs> yes. I don't have a criticism. You'll have to wait for somebody else to criticize you, but I have a question. Yes, you sir. You led into the last section with a discussion of effectively build to last. Intel is a company built to last. You're now, I think, arguing that the next generation of companies will not be built to turn over. Yes. Say more. Yeah, we're going to go through this sort of interregnum here that's going to be interesting because we have a lot of companies that are sitting on literally Everest of cash. Facebook, Apple. Mm -hmm. I figured out that Apple has enough cash on hand, I think it's $400 billion, that they could literally buy the entire next generation of startups just control it all. Hmm. Uh, I think that that's created this interesting distortion where for the very first time in my memory, M&A is actually more interesting than IPOs. When, when, when um, WhatsApp sells for $19 billion, it's got 55 employees and it's been in existence for three years. Uh, you know, no IPO does that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, every employee of, of WhatsApp is gonna get a minimum of something like $50 million some of them have only worked there for like, you know, 11 hard months. They're going to get their 50 million bucks. Um, exit I, strategy. Yeah, I, there's exit strategy for you. I think we're going to see, I, I think the pace, th I think this is literally the first manifestation we're seeing of the pace of Moore's Law doing that mm. curve upwards. I don't think established companies now can keep up with the pace of change. Even cutting edge companies like Facebook. I think Mark Zuckerberg has a brilliant strategy. He is just, you know, Instagram, WhatsApp. I think he's, he knows Facebook is getting old. You know, I mean, your grandma's on, it, on Facebook and you're 19 years old, you know, and she's checking your party photos, you know. You, it's, so I think Facebook is becoming old. It's becoming, you know, obsolete. And, and I think Zuckerberg knows that. And instead of trying to keep propping up this existing company, which is the old strategy, he's just jumping from one hot company to the next, and he's got the dough to do it. And if you look and at he bought a hard, And he bought hardware. He bought the Oculus Rift. Yes, yes he did. Uh, once again, there, there's a little bit of hardware going uh -huh. on behind the scenes, yeah. So um, anyway, that's, I, I, think the, I think IPOs, 
IPOs just got crushed by Sarbanes-Oxley and all those other things, and they've just been limping along. They, you know, we're excited now when we get a couple of IPOs a month. I mean, you guys remember 1999. You had a couple of IPOs before breakfast. Uh, so, I, you know, if IPOs come back, yeah, I think we'll, we're going to see built a lot more companies trying to stick it out and endure for a long period of time. Uh, but for the short term, it's going to be, you know, build a company, dress up real pretty, and try to get the attention of Apple or Facebook. A question over here? Oh, wait, I'm sorry, one. somebody else has oh, the no, mic. Oh, no, 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 the pros You're don't get to ask You're questions. You're in such <laughs> trouble. You're in such trouble right now. Yeah. So I will quibble with something you said. I live in San Francisco, and I have no plans of moving, and I have a mortgage and two babies and a husband. So I think your worldview is a little bit suburban snob. Yes. But... <laughs> Um, you, and, you and Santos chair around. You're the last ones. <laughs> We're the last ones. Your, your kids my, are going to be the only ones in the schools. Yeah. My babies and I walk past heroin needles every day and feces on the way to the park. It's amazing. Um, so that way to is make not it, what I Way to make the for. Chamber of Commerce case for San Francisco. <laughs> no. Look, I hate it. I just live there. Um, so my question is actually about the role of women over the course of Silicon Valley as you've um, covered it. I think it's fascinating how, I mean, everyone knows there aren't enough women participating at the higher levels of power. We've talked about that to death. We've talked about ways it's changing, ways it's not changing. I think it's fascinating that in the early days of Fairchild, you see photos, and there's lines of women who are building all of these chips. I mean, right. the early days of Silicon Valley was really powered by women doing you go, this. You go back they to had Indi small oh, hands. Yeah. And you go back, you go back to ENIAC. Chips. ENIAC, it was all women running the, the computer, too. Right. And there's, yeah. if you look at the history of a lot of industries, like Hollywood, other industries, very early on, women were doing a lot of like the grunt labor of these things. Right. And then they became highly valuable, and women got squeezed out. I'm curious what you've seen in the role of women through Silicon Valley, and do you see anything that should encourage young women coming into the industry? Hmm. Yeah, two things. One of them is... Um, I wrote a piece, I gave a speech at Oxford a couple years ago, and I looked at the humanities. I, I was sort of incensed because Oxford Today magazine, had, the cover was, are the humanities dead? And my thought was, no, not, we, we tend to, during periods of technological innovation, focus on the technology, but we forget that ultimately comes down to the interface between human beings and technology. And that is art and literature and storytelling. Every startup I've ever been involved with it didn't come down to the technology. It came down to who could tell a really good story to a venture capitalist. Um, that world uh, is still dominated by women. And I think, you know, there's always been the, the PR and marketing and advertising ghetto for women. But I think in, in, the, in the world of the future where you have to cut through all that noise and get people to buy into your story, uh, I think women have a distinct advantage there. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is I'll predict now that the face of Silicon Valley in 15 years, when we think of Silicon Valley, it's going to be an Indian woman. I think, that, I think you look at the trajectories of the different, uh, mm. of the two genders and the, and the uh, ethnicity, I think that's the future of Silicon Valley. Mm. So if it's not... I'm, I'm thinking of somebody like Padma Warrior. There uh, you go. At, at Cisco. At Cisco, absolutely. Yeah. She was on my debate team. Yeah, uh, brilliant lady. I think... I think um, you know, we're seeing a growing number of uh, women CEOs of the, of the big companies, you know, I look around mm -hmm. you, Yahoo, HP. Uh, I think that trajectory is going to continue. And I also think, like I said, Indian woman, that's the face of Silicon Valley in 2020, 25. Yeah. Absolutely. Next question. Oh, um, is this on? Yeah. So it's yeah. a kind of a, a markets and governments type uh, question. I mean, could you comment on um, what role, if any, uh, Kennedy's almost, if you will, uh, patronage of Noyce and uh, Fairchild through Apollo, uh, you know, played in perhaps uh, speeding up the, the whole evolutionary process or perhaps making things uh, possible at all that might not have been. Yeah, that's a real tricky one. It, uh, you can, I've seen, there, there are alternative histories of Silicon Valley. One of them says it was the Cold War and the Vietnam War and the Apollo program and forgotten in the mix is the government requirement for all TVs as of 1965 or something to have UHF. These government things, you could argue, created Silicon Valley because they provided a lot of the business. On the other hand, it was a devil's bargain. 
because one of the problems with working with the government is the government wants you to continue uh, making or at least keeping an inventory all products that they've ever bought. And I remember I was at HP uh, 1975, I think, and Bill Hewlett just out of frustration announced, we're not taking any more government contracts. We're just not going to do it anymore because they want special things. They want it to be radiation hardened to go in a space capsule. That doesn't help us when we're selling to consumers. Uh, they want us to keep inventories of old HP, you know, oscilloscopes from 1952, and they got out of the business. So in a weird way, the defense industry and the feds drove, they funded the Valley, but at a certain point, basically in the late 60s, the last great contribution of the government is uh, ARPANET. Mm -hmm. And, but I saw ARPANET. Any of you play with ARPANET? When it, for, yeah, it was awful. I remember sitting there, I, I was up at uh, Xerox Park, and they said, here, you can talk to any university in America. And I sat down, and it was just numbers, and, and it, was, it had the worst user interface imaginable. And if left in the government's hands, the internet would have never happened. The World Wide Web would have never happened. We'd still be sitting there talking to, you know, with 45 numbers before we said hello, you know, to Jet and Propulsion Laboratory. And then Al Gore came along and invented the internet. Well, no, he, he, he gets credit, actually, for commercializing it. Well, That's you really know, what he, what yeah, he helped do. I mean, put it into the commercial sector. You know, I mean, that was his... I, I understand. And, and, and you, can make it, you can make an argument. He actually was, as much, as, as much misery as he took for it, he actually did play a hand in it. Yes, I, crucial, he, he exaggerated. But yeah, the it, crucial thing was the military was important, but the military got in the way. And, the, you know, when the Vietnam War ended and the Apollo program ended, it left this town high and dry. Mm -hmm. uh, the single worst recession in Valley history, I still think, now 2008 was awful, uh, but I think, you know, 1974, mm -hmm. and it was mostly because the, the majority of the people working in this Valley worked for Lockheed, and there was one dad on every block who got laid off in 74. Mm -hmm. The level of misery was unbelievable. The Valley had to recover from that, and it had to learn how to produce consumer and commercial products, and that was and industrial products, and that was the big turning point in, in making the valley into what the valley is now. So can I just follow up quickly on that? So do you think it's really, it, there was, it's a little bit of both, like the government kind of ceded certain things, commercial sector took it yes. further? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, we had, the gr we had the great debate between Bob Noyce and T.J. Rogers well, over Semitech. And Noyce, you know, he he'd committed so far that he basically went to Semitech and ran it and it killed him. But it was $300 million to start it as a government project. Mm -hmm. And T.J. Rogers' argument was, why don't you just break it into $30, $10 million lumps and give it to startups? They'll do a better job. And I think this is the tension that's always mm -hmm. defined Silicon Valley. You know, we, the entrepreneur versus, you know, big money, big industry, and that sort of thing. Next question. So, uh, yes. So... Uh I like what you said about hardware. I've been here for a while. Hardware, I come from that side of the fence. But on the other hand, if you look out there, there's plenty of software. So help us out with why things are changing back to hardware in your view. I just don't like to hear your views on that. Oh, okay. I think code only gets you so far. Software only gets you so far. At some point, you have to interact with the physical world. You know, we took the internet as We've taken it just about as far as you can go of people communicating with each other, searching for information, that kind of thing. But if we want to manage the world, we have to move on. And that's why we're seeing the rise of the Internet of Things. There's this sort of thinginess that's starting to happen out there. Uh, we, don't give, we don't give Texas Instruments enough credit for sticking with analog. I mean, they kind of had to because they screwed up digital, but they did stick with analog. And, you know, the... the the translating of the analog world to the digital world now is the centerpiece of our lives. I mean, the, the, what is big data? Big data is taking advantage of the sensor revolution. You know, they got, I, I just, I wrote a book last year, the big picture book, I don't know if you guys saw it on big data, and uh, uh, with Rick Smolin, the photographer, and he gathered up all these applications of big data around the world, and they were all sensor-based. I mean, we're at the point now that they're counting, they're, they've, they've now done a census of every single tree in the Amazon basin, and they monitor each tree for its health. They're counting every fish going by a certain point off of Australia. 
They're going to start throwing sensors into the atmosphere and just let them float around. And that'll give us very, very precise micrometeorology. These things are all physical things connecting to the physical world. And with the Internet of Things, our things are going to be talking to our other things. You know, the, our car is going to call the parking lot and see if there's any slots. And then Bill Bank of America. You know, I mean, it's, this is where we're going. It, we've, we've reached the limit of this sort of airy, mental, cognitive world, and we're heading now back into getting your fingers dirty in the physical world. Was that even clear? Okay, good. Yes? Hi. Um, I'm a 23-year veteran of Intel, and I've been gone eight years. Um, Andy Bryant said something in an interview about three months ago, and he said when he was picking the new CEO that the board really wanted a cultural change. Being an outsider now, I'm wondering if you have any inside knowledge or an opinion about what he thought the culture change should be. The culture? The intel culture. Yes. Um, you want a personal opinion of how your culture has changed? Well, I'd like to know what you, th what you personally think and what you think they want to change about the culture. I think you guys aren't as arrogant as you used to be, and I think that's a bad thing. Uh, I really, you know, as a reporter, as a cub reporter, for the Merck, I would go out to Intel, and it, I would always be kind of intimidated and pissed off at the same time, because Intel was just, it was a very, very cocky, arrogant, you know, <laughs> we're smarter than you, we're not only smarter than you, but we're better than you. I mean, we know how to do stuff better than you, and we don't screw up, which gave me great satisfaction writing this book of just enumerating all the screw-ups. Uh, <laughs> and I had a secretary, I had a secretary when I was at HP, in 1975, and her husband had a heart attack. He worked for Intel. He had a heart attack at a Sunday morning meeting. And the, the crucial thing in there is not the heart attack. It's the Sunday morning meeting. You know, the, I mean, the, the, the feel at Intel was it was, just rever it was just vibrating whenever you walked in there. And everybody was serious. And they were arrogant. And they were full of themselves. And they were going to rule the world. As, in, as, as dislikable as that was to a reporter, I really admired it. That Intel had a winner attitude from day one. And it took that winner attitude to survive Operation Crush. It took that winner attitude to deal with the, uh, the scandal of the Pentium bug. I mean, here's, you guys had, had basically not realized that you had entered into a compact with consumers. Once you started convincing consumers to look through the computer and find the, the Intel processor, you had, made an, you had made a deal with them that you didn't know you had made. You thought you were just selling a whole lot more chips, but you were also selling Intel never letting the consumer down. And then so when Pentium hit, the Pentium bug hit, it just caught you guys blindsided. And Andy, worst of all, I think Andy's single greatest moment of leadership is he went home that weekend and did a 180 and came back and said, you know what, we're wrong, we'll replace all the chips. I think that, would have, that was almost an existential moment in Intel's story. You guys could have really been hurt by that. I, I wonder if it, some people here actually may not know that, that story at all. It is, uh, and it wasn't a significant bug in many respects. It blew up, though, in the public. The, the, the estimate right? was that you would run into that bug as a normal human being once every 10,000 years. It was that minor. Right. Every processor before it had bugs, but you just notified the computer companies and they adjusted for it. But now with Intel inside, mm -hmm. you were talking to consumers. And consumers, all they heard was, there's a bug. And they thought, oh my god, all my, all my uh, financial records are going to disappear. I'm going to file bad tax records. I'm going, it's gonna, my car's going to crash. The planes are going to crash. I mean, they had, they had no sense of scale or context of what it meant. Intel's reaction was, if you really think that's a problem, you're an idiot. <laughs> that was Andy's statement. Only, a, I think Andy's statement was, only a fool would be concerned about something this minor. Well, that was a big, le this, is, this is Intel learning a lesson. Mm -hmm. Intel is a very interesting company because it seems to have this ability to continuously learn. Not many companies, they say when you're a president of the United States, you really don't learn anything as president because you're in such a vacuum that mm -hmm. you basically, all you have is your life experiences to bring to bear. You really can't, you really don't improve as, as a human being as president of the United States. Companies have that problem when they reach a certain size. They can't hear the world anymore. And, they, and so they, they lie to themselves. They, they convince themselves that the opposite is true of what it really is. 
and they get blindsided and they get killed. Well, in some ways, Andy was right, but sometimes this was a situation well, where you had point. to learn. It wasn't about being right. That's right. Yeah, and, and that's, what An <laughs> that's what Andy that had to learn. This is where the, it clashed with that culture of we're smarter than everybody. It was, if you're just not smart enough to appreciate this isn't a problem. You know, that's like, that's how you get an F in marketing 101. <laughs> you know, call your customers stupid. And <laughs> yeah. And so I think this is something that's unique about this company. They learn from their mistakes, and they learn fast. Any other questions? Yes, one more oh, question. Well, yeah. I'm sure there are others, but you spoke about the Internet, and one of the beauties of the Internet is that even though it kind of came out of the government, <clears throat> it has been pretty much unfettered for many, many years. But I heard a Google executive speak recently about the death of the Internet, because of the intrusion of government, not only domestically, but internationally, in the internet. So for example, in Europe, there are a lot of suits that are being brought and they're being won by individuals who want to have their information taken off of the internet because they don't like it for some reason or another. And then you have governments that want to control the right. messages that are going out in their countries. So would you speak to the survival yeah, and, and, of the and it's internet? Really, it's really two big problems. There's net neutrality and then there's privacy. Um, you know, about six months ago, I was sitting working on, I think I was working on the Intel book, and my 23-year-old walked in with a, with a roll of electrician's tape, and he just tore off a piece and put it over the camera on my laptop and kept walking. And I said, what are you doing? And he said, uh, I'm covering the camera. I don't want you being watched. And I said, well, that isn't going to happen. I said, they might check my email. The NSA might be looking at my, you know, surfing the web. A month later, you know, there was a school that gave out laptops to all their kids, and they, and they found a way to have the camera send the images, even when it was turned off. Um, I'm really bothered by this, both of these things. Uh, one of the things that concerns me is I'm, a, I'm the son of a spook. I mean, my dad was, was a spy. I mean, I know that world. Mm. And, and I understand the need to gather information. What bothers me is how easily this new generation of you know, young uh, social networking types acquiesced to the government's demands. It was like, what do you want? You know, come on, take what you need. I mean, uh, AOL, no one knows this, but AOL cut a deal with the NSA like early on. Hmm. If you ever was on AOL, the government was watching you. Uh, the idea, and this is, goes back to this notion that the people running this new generation of companies have a very little respect for the notion of privacy. Uh, they're, they're, they're perfectly willing to take your purchases and tell all your friends about them. Uh, they're willing to gather data about you by, you know, searching through your files. Uh, it's just the next step to letting, letting Big Brother do it. I don't see the earlier generations of this valley ever allowing that to occur. I think it would have been a major fight. Uh, the other thing about parceling up the internet between the free stuff and the government controlled stuff and deciding what people are allowed to look at and what they're not, I find that despicable. Uh, I can understand why, you know, China might want to do it. I don't understand why we allow them to do that. Um, the, the internet is the most liberating thing, phenomena of our lifetimes. It, it, it's the most democratizing thing maybe in human history. Why we would ever back off from that and return to something return to the old days is beyond me. You know, this is sort of a fight to the death sort of thing, frankly. Hmm. We have time Sarah, for you agree with that? Where are you? Yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. We have time for another um, question. But Sarah Lacey of Pando Daily. By the way, their series on price fixing by companies in this valley, employee salary fixing, uh, is the best piece of investigative reporting I've seen around here in, in a dozen years. One of the things we suffered from is newspapers have died. Uh, I was an investigative reporter. Right. I'm the guy that broke the story on toxics in the valley. Nobody does that anymore. No, there's, mm -hmm. Newspapers don't have investigative reporters. And so, and bloggers, they don't have time or money to do it. And so, there, I think there are some real scandals out there that we don't know anything about because no one's been looking. And thankfully, Pando found this, this, this salary fixing thing which is egregious. I mean, the major companies of the Valley were setting uh, salary levels and not agreeing not to poach on each other. Right, so there was none of that in, back in the bar room, hey, you want to come yeah. work for my company? They yeah, were and so what that means that. is you don't understand why you can't get a job anywhere else yeah. and you're stuck where you are. Who are the victims in all that? 
it's not the companies, mm -hmm. you know, it's these poor working people. And I think that they all got away with it because it had the magic name of Steve Jobs attached to it. Yeah. Yes. Another question, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I just moved to the Bay Area about two weeks ago, and I think coming here today has given me a lot more respect for what the area has been. Did you, did you make a down payment on a house? No, I don't have a mortgage. <laughs> I'm not married yet. Uh, I am Indian, though. I'm not a woman, unfortunately, so I don't think I'll be a CEO. Well, you're halfway so. there. <laughs> Um, I was curious about one of, the, one of the things that you spoke about, which is about getting marketing into a world of technology. Yeah. And as someone who's, who was a business major in grad school, I'm just curious as to how you see that shaping up over the next decade or so. Is there really a place for people who are not from the technology world in Silicon Valley, or do you see that as something that is essential to the success of Silicon Valley going forward? Do you have to be a technologist to survive in Silicon Valley? I mean, is that the heart of your question? I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I think the Valley's always been sort of like the, the Army. You know, you look, at, you look at combat, 10 percent of the soldiers are actually there on Omaha Beach, and everybody else is in support. I look around this Valley, and I see, you know, restaurants, marketing firms, PR firms, advertising firms, consulting firms, recruiting firms, uh, packaging, design. Uh, you know, the, the Valley, the, the, what we think of as Silicon Valley is maybe 20 or 30 percent of this overall thing. And I think it, um, it, will, it will remain that way if maybe even gets smaller. I think tech, as, as part of you know, the, the, the thing that began with Operation Crush of the solution, I think the actual technology component of the solution gets smaller by the year. I think it's all the stuff around it. I mean, the iPhone is a, is a, was a profoundly interesting new consumer product and a piece of hardware. But what makes the iPhone really interesting is that there's 300,000 apps that people designed for it. And 99% of those people were not technologists. They were people that were living out in the world who saw a problem and mm -hmm. said, you know, that we could create an app to deal with that. And I really think that's, that's where the future really lies. You know, this giant penumbra of opportunity around this each new core technology breakthrough. And I would just point out, Cheryl Sandberg, um, who's risen quite high in the Valley, is, has a business background. She doesn't have a technology background, and she's the CEO of Facebook. So, um, But we're exactly. going to have to wrap it up. I think we're, we're about out of time. Um, this has been such an interesting conversation, and there, there were a lot of little stories and anecdotes in this book. Yes, that 500 I, pages, I, I, that, <laughs> Exactly, that, that I could have kept drawing out of you, but um, we're out of time. Um, thank you so much. It's been thank a you. pleasure chatting fun. with you. How, how many people here listen to NPR? All right. I, 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 didn't, I didn't ask you for money even once, but the number to call, no. So our thanks to both of you for giving us a very special experience. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so, so much. You guys. Thanks Thank for the great you. question. Thank you. And as a, a very small token of our appreciation, we have for you some hardware. It is a <laughs> Churchill Club t-shirt. Oh, nice. You can always go into the t-shirt business. It's I hope you wear it in good health. I do. Thank I wear you. my old, the one you gave me last at the debates. Awesome. As uh, Books Inc. has books for sale for you as a courtesy outside, and Mike has graciously agreed to stick around for a bit and personalize your copy if you wish. Thanks again to Intel, and you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much, and we hope to see you soon. Good night.